today's episode of Still Could Be Determined, we're talking about nuclear fusion energy. And as usual, I'm Matt Farrell, which shouldn't be a surprise at this point, but I'm not being joined by my brother, Sean, this week. We're taking a little time off for the holidays. So for today's episode, I thought it'd be fun to share one of my interviews with Mike Donaldson, who's the vice president of fusion and island engineering at General Fusion. They're a company that I covered in a recent video on Undecided about nuclear fusion energy and what they're doing. I'll include a link in the podcast description if you'd like to check that episode out. But without further ado, here's my conversation with Mike. So Mike, I was hoping that you could kind of start things off with just ex- tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into fusion. Sure. Um, I'm an engineer, um, but I've spent my entire career in sort of early stage product development. And so it's kind of in what we would call sort of low technology readiness levels. So it's past the science part but it's before commercialization. So the best way for me to think about it is, is you know, it requires technology development and, and requires a bit of a science mindset, but it also requires uh, the pragmatism that comes from engineering, right? So right. it's very early, it, you know, it's before the product, um, but it's definitely past the science for science sake part. So that's kind of what I've done in my career is I've worked on new novel technologies and specifically very disruptive technologies. And and so when he started up this company and he was looking for uh, help, approached me and asked me if I'd join him. So I joined very early. We I was employee number five. I really joined, well, I joined for lots of reasons. Very important mission, obviously. It's a big, tough problem, and I like working on tough problems. And it was a great opportunity to join a company that was trying to do something big and join them at the beginning. Uh, combine that with the fact that I knew the founder, uh, and yeah. I knew he... I knew his quality, let's just say. So I figured it was worthwhile to kind of join up for the ride. So that was 13 and a half years ago. We were five of us in a very small unit in the same place where we are right now. Um, We've Mm -hmm. expanded to take over, I do believe, nine units in this office park. And we're upwards of 200 employees now. And we've even outgrown this office park. So we're moving into a new set of labs here in Vancouver uh, in the next quarter. So... It's been super exciting. I always like to tell people that, you know, I've been here 13 years and I learned something every day, whether it's about the business, whether it's about fusion, whether it's about engineering. And it's, uh, it's been an awesome ride and we're at a really exciting time in the company right now. So I'm looking forward to it continuing. For General Fusion's approach, you're using, was it magnetized target fusion? That's right. Yeah. Is what you're, yeah. Yeah. Um, Could you kind of walk through the high level, how your system works? Sure. So magnetized target fusion is it really takes the benefits of what's known out there in the fusion right now and and in the fusion world right now and puts a pragmatic approach on it so the big advantages of our technology are they really remove the traditional barriers that have stood in the way of commercializing fusion so we definitely need the fusion part to happen (laughs) we don't shy away from the fact that if you're going to produce a fusion power plant you have to have the fusion working But from the first day, we've always looked at it as, okay, well, how do I turn that into a practical, economical solution that can be able to produce power? And so the really the main component to our technology is that we're using a um, liquid metal wall to uh, um, heat up the fusion fuel to fusion condition. It's it's much like a diesel engine, but quite a bit bigger and uh, requires a little bit more science. So the big advantage that that has for us is it, well, first of all, the main energy driver that's collapsing that uh, liquid metal cavity is steam driven pistons. So this is a known technology that we are applying to our approach. The other big advantage of it is, is because the fusion is happening in the middle of a cavity of uh, liquid metal, it produces a big burst of energy. And that's obviously what you want for a power plant. But the way that it produces that energy in, in, in traditional fusion approaches, that energy actually damages your machine. And so by us having the fusion reaction happen at the center of a big cavity of liquid metal, that liquid metal uh, protects the rest of the machine. It also serves to capture the heat from the energy that's being released from fusion. So we have a natural way of having machine that can withstand the energy and withstand the the fusion reaction. And we also have a natural way of being able to to capture that energy in in a known way. You can take that liquid metal, put it through a heat exchanger, boil steam, and then 
you know, all sorts of traditional technologies from uh, use steam to turn a turbine. So that part is known. So mm -hmm. it's really a, a practical uh, approach um, that removes those traditional barriers uh, um, that other fusion approaches uh, still haven't um, overcome yet. So you don't it doesn't require the use of gigantic magnets to keep. No, it doesn't require right. it doesn't require large superconducting magnets to mm. hold the the plasma stability together. It doesn't require very large lasers to to do that as well. All of the hardware that we use to operate our machine is known technology. Uh, it does have to be done in a precise way. You know, we 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 can't we can't make a fusion reaction happen in a diesel engine. So we are definitely <laughs> adapting that technology. Um, yeah. We're definitely adapting that technology to our approach. But the idea is that you're using known engineering technology and then combining that all together uh, to produce the fusion reaction. So it's the way in which we produce the fusion reaction and the tools that we use to do that, um, that allow us to do it in a, in a practical and pragmatic and economic way. Yeah. Well, one person I was talking to in the past about fusion, different techniques had brought up how there's kind of a spectrum between you have all the engineering things figured out or you have the physics figured out and you're somewhere on that spectrum. And some of these, like the gigantic iter, I know it's an oversimplification, but That's like okay. yeah. iter is, iter is more, has more of the physics figured out, but they're, they're struggling with the engineering side. And there's other techniques that have more of the engineering figured out. And there's more questions on the physics side. Do you agree with that assessment? And if you do, like where, where it sounds like you kind of got more of the engineering side kind of nailed down because you're using known ways like the steam to the steam. Uh, pistons and all that kind of stuff. It sounds so, like you're. So while I agree with you that it's an oversimplification, I understand where it's coming yeah. from. Yeah. You know, you need both, first of all, right? You yeah. need the engineering yeah. pragmatism and you need the fusion to happen. But what's unique about general fusion is we started from the get go with commercial commercialization in mind. So our founder came up came up with an idea. He's a very smart man. He's a plasma physicist. He did his PhD in in fusion. And, but he also spent a career in industry and uh, building products. And so he understood that, again, you needed both. So General Fusion is really the first company that set out and said, okay, we don't just want to create fusion. We want to create a fusion power plant. And what that means is every day in our culture and our approach, we have to have that path to commercialization in mind. Now, what makes it very interesting is you still, as I said before, you need the science to work. And so it's not that we're ignoring the science. And in fact, you, you can't have, like I said, you can't have a fusion power plant without fusion. But yeah. at the core of our company culture and at the core of our mission is to do it in a way that is commercializable. It's a really interesting, I think, I think it's, I think that's that point that we that we sit at in the development of our technology is is really important and really interesting. So you do need to it's technology development. You need to be open to new solutions and new ways of doing things. But and and you've got to be careful of overly bounding people. But at the same time, the guiding principle is, OK, that's great. Please let me know how that can please demonstrate to me how that can help in our path to commercialization. And I think it keeps our team and our company very focused on what the end goal is. So it sounds like because of that, you're looking at the whole, <laughs> the whole puzzle, which is also supply chain, how you'd maintain it, making sure you have the materials and everything to a commercialize. Absolutely. Or and absolutely. And so from the commercialization standpoint, um, we want to make sure that we're not using any exotic materials. So you bring up supply chain while we do need to partner uh, with suppliers that can build big industrial equipment. There's lots of people out there that can build big industrial equipment. And while we do need to select those suppliers and partners so that they can work with us on the development of this technology, we are not establishing a new supply chain. We do not need to create a supply chain for superconducting magnet. Uh, and we think about the operation of the machine. We think about the how long is this machine going to last? Does that make sense in a, in a commercial setting? You know, and are we on the path to being able to do that? While... I, I think that's key to our approach. While, while clearly we are uh, um, um, 
well, clearly on the path to providing power in 2030, and there's a lot to in the, in the 2030s, and there's a lot to there's a lot to do from here on out. Um, right. We are making sure that we're keeping all of those things in mind as we go forward. Right. Which which actually leads to one of my questions I had around the lithium metal. Yes. Not the lithium metal. The liquid the liquid liquid metal. Yep. Is from my understanding is you actually from the reaction that's happening, you're actually converting some of that metal into was it tritium? A and... very, very, very small amount. So okay. the the vast majority of fusion approaches, not all of them, but the vast majority of, fu of, of fusion approaches are doing a form of fusion, which is which is fusing two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. Okay, mm -hmm. so deuterium is hydrogen with one neutron on it. You might have heard of heavy water. Mm -hmm. That heavy water is made with water with deuterium. So it, it's still hydrogen, but it's got a neutron in the in the nucleus as well. Um, tritium has it, it has one more neutron in it. Deuterium is naturally occurring. Um, we can get deuterium from seawater, and we do that every day. Like like Canada actually um, is is a leader in 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 the production and use of heavy water because of our uh, uh, because of the fission reactors that we've developed in Canada. So deuterium we know how to get. Now tritium is not naturally occurring; it decays. And so in order for you to have a, a fusion power plant that runs on deuterium and tritium, you need to have a source of tritium. It's mm -hmm. not naturally occurring. What general fusion approach, what general fusions approach does is we make our own tritium. This isn't, this isn't unique to general fusion. The reaction of the fusion reaction with lithium producing tritium is looked at by a couple of other approaches out there. But what is unique to general fusion is we make enough tritium to be able to run our power plant. So mm. this is another one of those ideas where we've leveraged some existing technologies and some existing science, but we've been able to leverage it in a way that it makes our power plant sustainable. Right. And one question that's kind of fast forwarding to like when you do have a working plant, this is since it's like a diesel engine, it's going to be like an engine that's constantly running. Yep. How often does it? How often does it have to kind of pulse or yep. to to maintain to maintain its load that that's it's going right. to be providing? Yeah. So it, it it it's going to pulse on a on a, a rate of about one times per second, and that is in order to put enough energy on the grid. So it you can slow it down a little bit. You can. You can speed it up a little bit, but what we're aiming for right now in order to make the economics work is about one time per second. Okay. And I, the, one of the other questions I had was I, I had read that you've gone through many iterations of the, what is it, the, the piston? Um, the we've gone through a couple of iterations of the piston. I mean, um, mm -hmm. we've, we've, we, we've been on a technology development path. We've been developing the technology for 20 years. And what our approach has been is let's develop the individual subsystems first and on their own basically okay. in order for us to demonstrate in order to demonstrate fusion we really need to do it at scale and so the technology development approach has been okay well let's take a look at all the components that we need the liquid metal the pistons how to make how to inject the fuel that's what we call our plasma injector how to the shape of the plasma fuel to put it into the liquid metal cavity and for the last 20 years we've been developing all of those independently now what we're doing is we're putting them all together into our fusion demonstration plan. And what the fusion demonstration plan is going to show, when we put all those components and systems together, we will reach fusion temperatures and it will validate our approach and validate the economics in a commercial sense. And that's what you're going to be building what, over the next five years? You're that's building what we're building that. over in, in, in the United Kingdom at the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy, yes. One of the questions I had was, are you how are you using machine learning and computer modeling in <laughs> yeah, evolving sure. your technology for sure yeah so machine learning computer modeling simulation that those capabilities have grown as you know exponentially over the last you know 20 30 years and so we're leveraging simulation in particular modeling in particular in in our design so we use computational fluid dynamics modeling to develop how to form that liquid metal cavity and what's going to happen to that cavity when it can when it compresses. We've just gotten into using AI and, and where we would use that in particular is on the analysis of our of our data. So when we're developing this technology, I mentioned earlier how 
we need to, we made all the components. One of those components we made is something called a plasma injector. That's really the, at the source, what, what we need to understand how that fuel, when it compresses, is going to heat up. And so in our labs here in Vancouver, you know, we have the, one of the world's largest plasma injectors and, and we make these fuel targets, we call them by target mean it's the thing that's going to be compressed. We make these fuel mm-hmm. targets every day and we measure them and we get data off them and we get, you know, I'm not sure if it's gigabytes of data for every time we, we create a uh, plasma, but it's, it's right up there. And so right. one of the ways that we can leverage uh, machine learning is uh, by throwing it at that data set to really understand what we've got. Do you think the computer modeling that we have available today is one of the reasons it feels like fusion research has kind of accelerated? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the uh, capabilities, the capabilities of both supercomputers and and other you know more conventional clusters has gone up, and so it's accelerated the pace at which everybody you know us other privates and the the fusion industry that's that's always been there in academia and national labs um, have accelerated their learning 100. percent Yeah, it's it's from the outside looking in, it feels like over the past five to ten years, things around fusion have just accelerated to a point where we've kind of never seen it like this before. And the big influx of private funding into companies like General Fusion Absolutely. has sped up. And yeah. I think that's driven by a few things. You know, people are starting to realize that the time for fusion is now. And they're starting to realize that the capabilities and the ability to produce fusion is right now. It, it, it's going to serve a need. The thing, the thing about fusion is that it's going to be clean, on-demand, uh, reliable, safe energy. It has no emissions. Nobody would argue about the benefits of fusion. Uh, you, you, you can, you can see the benefits of it. There's obviously a need for that right now with our, with our current climate and combined with, so, so you have the need and combined with the fact that people are realizing that, wow, these, these, the science base, um, these supporting technologies like AI, 3D printing, additive manufacturing is really coming into to those capabilities have built up over the last period of time advanced modeling and simulation capabilities, add all those together with the ability to add all those together, which increases your ability to execute and deliver, combine that with the need has really led to a massive investment in fusion. The other thing I've been finding interesting is the private companies are pretty much all saying the same thing. Like General Fusion is saying this, like you just said it today, your goal is commercialization, net positive electricity production. It's like, that's, that is the goal. That's your North star. Yep. What's, what's your take on kind of the fusion reporting up until this point, which tends to focus on things like the, the Q factor, and it tends to create confusion in the public when, like, what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard, right? Um, it, yeah. it, kind of, it kind of comes back to my point of what General Fusion, I really believe, is the first company that from the get-go was thinking about commercialization. And right. it also comes back to my point about what I said earlier. Okay, so clearly you need the fusion in you need the fusion to work in order to have a fusion power plant. So you have to have both. And I think up until General Fusion came along, look, the fusion part is hard. Let's not, let's not deny it. I mean, it would be very difficult to say that it's, it's not a big, it's not a big problem. You know, this is a problem that we're, that we're trying to solve and has to be solved, but you need both components of it to it. And so that's where General Fusion, I said, has come in with our approach, uh, combines a pragmatism and, and a goal on you need both you need the ability not only to have the fusion reaction but you need the ability to do it in a way that is uh practical uh econ- and economical and that's why when we focus on the the collapsing liquid metal wall driven by steam powered pistons you know that's that's existing that's existing technology and i think that gives us a decided advantage yeah, i mean you're you're talking about having a demonstrator in five years or so talking about the 2030s for commercialized products yep a lot of people are highly skeptical of this sure. how, how do you how do you respond to that skepticism well we have a plan and we have a plan that uh demonst- that shows our path to commercialization so the first part is to demonstrate our approach at scale in parallel with that, we're developing some of the commercial technologies and 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 partnering partnering with suppliers and other partners where appropriate to put those in parallel. It's definitely an aggressive schedule for sure, but we have to we have to keep our eye on the ball. And so, for me, I really see the fusion demonstration plant as a step 
towards that. We're not forgetting about the commercialization. We are doing it in parallel. But the most important part is to get this fusion demonstration plant demonstrating that we can reach fusion conditions at scale. After that, there will be some challenges. It's not all done. But yeah. the opportunities to leverage, I wouldn't even necessarily say existing technology, but existing commercial solutions is very clear at that point. So the first thing that we have to have aggressive time schedules, but we feel they're realistic. And But we are going to focus on that next key step first, I guess would be the best way for me to put it. What do you see as the biggest challenges ahead of you over the next three to five years? Wow, that's a that's a difficult question. You know, <laughs> I, as I said, I, you heard early on, I'm employee number five in a, in a in a fusion company that's trying to do something big. So obviously, I'm fairly uh, uh, detail oriented. So I'm, yeah, you know, I've got a lot of stuff in my head. I think one of the biggest challenges that we've that we've got, and but our company is actually set up for this, is we need to be we need to be nimble. This is a new technology and we need to, we need to be nimble and we need to be able to move fast. Um, we also need to be able to do that at scale, right? I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a big machine. I, I just mentioned earlier, this isn't something that we're going to be able to do. Um, this isn't something that we're going to be able to do on our desktop. Now, the advantages that we have of that is we have partnered up with uh, a world-class fusion organization that in the UK at the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy that has built at scale fusion devices before, not our device, but they, 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 we can leverage their expertise in uh, applying to, uh, to, to our approach. Um, Are you talking about JET? Are you talking about the, the JET? Yeah, the UKAA, Correct. they built JET, absolutely. Okay. And they have experience with building these big, large fusion test beds. It's not exactly the same as ours, but there is a lot of experience that we're going to be able to leverage out of that. So we're really set up well with an, with an incredible partner um right uh, that can help us along that journey the other thing is is we are partnering with uh, on the engineering side then we 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 have uh, commercial partners that are helping it, it accelerate that so i think the biggest challenge that we have as a company is keeping that small nimble let's go get it done attitude but leveraging these other partners to be able to do it at scale but to be perfectly honest with you it's a pretty fun challenge to have yeah so the questions i had was your private company but how important is like governmental support in advancing fusion? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a social problem, right? And I think government plays an important role. So we've been uh, massively supported by the Canadian government in particular. We are a Canadian company. We are based in Canada, I should say. Um, but we are yeah. getting support from the UK government. And we've just recently got some government support from the United States in the form of two infuse grants. Um, so government definitely plays a role. And I think government has recognized that over the last five to 10 years. Um, it is a, look, General Fusion has many stakeholders. We have investors who've invested in us to solve this problem. We have employees and, and we have social stakeholders as well. And, and, and the government plays a part in those, uh, in representing those social stakeholders, I would say. And so we've been very fortunate to have support from all the governments where we're located and we're looking forward to continuing to grow that support. Right. One question I, I meant to ask this earlier, the demonstrator is not going to be grid tied. It's going to be in That's its own. Right. right. Yeah. But how much, like, what is your target goal for how much electricity you're trying to produce? When we get to the commercial plant? Yes. Yeah. When we get to the commercial plant, one unit, think about it, we, we call it a, a fusion island. So one unit, one heat engine. Um, will eventually turn into 100 megawatts on uh, around 100 megawatts on the grid. As to whether or not um, you have multiple engines that tie into one back end with you know one heat exchanger, you know one turbine set, you know that's about that's to that's to be determined. Um, but all of that back end set, like I said, is is commercially available. So we really think about ourselves as the as the heat engine that feeds into that, and okay. um, the size of it is going to be on the order of 100 megawatts. So it sounds like it's a modular system where you could kind of scale it up to whatever you need. Yeah, for, absolutely. So yeah. it doesn't, uh, each one of those is, is, um, uh, just, pr that's exactly right. It is a modular system for sure. Okay. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you'd want to bring up about general fusion? I mean, the benefits of fusion are clear. Like I said, they're, it's clean on demand energy and it's safe, no emissions, you know, general fusion is an industry leader and what's unique about us is our pragmatic and practical approach 
to providing fusion energy. And the last thing I guess I would say is, as we've mentioned, you know, the time for fusion is now. We see, you know, government funding and the technological advances all coming together at once. And I think General Fusion is in a great position to be able to leverage that. Right. And on a personal level, how, how, how do you feel about the entire fusion industry at large? Do you, do you feel like there's a lot of really exciting advancement happening? Absolutely. I mean, like, what's your, um, so yeah. I've been here, like I said, for 13 years. And when I started at General Fusion, there were very few privates. And the privates were kind of looked at a little bit uh, sideways, to be perfectly honest with you. (laughs) Um, But we're getting a lot of validation, I guess would be the best way to put it, not only through our investment, but within the fusion community. You know, there's a bunch of very smart uh, plasma physicists that are going into uh, going in and working for the privates. Like I said, we've now partnered with uh, the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy, the home of JET. It is an incredibly exciting time to be in fusion. And just the fact that the industry is growing and there's more interest in it just in, in, increases the chances that uh, we're going to be able to deliver. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. No problem. I'd like to thank Mike and General Fusion for being willing to talk to me about fusion and their technology. It was an absolute pleasure talking to them. And do you have any thoughts on General Fusion or Fusion in general? Drop a comment below the video if you're watching this on YouTube, or feel free to shoot us a message through the contact information in the podcast description. If you'd like to support the show, please consider reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening. And don't forget to subscribe on any of those platforms or YouTube. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can hit the join button on YouTube, or you can also go to stilltbd.fm and click the become a supporter button to throw us a few coins. And as Sean likes to say, throw a few coins at our heads. Thanks so much for listening or watching. We'll see you in the next one.